The changing landscape of work and blurring of boundaries between homes and workplaces are altering not just buildings, but also our streets. Despite the evolution of work as an extension of our love lifestyles, cities continue to approach urbanism using traditional methodologies. Against the backdrop of automation, business standards in complex a more dynamic, a dynamic mix of uses? How do we go beyond zoning for design to connect people, their lifestyles and changing spatial and cultural needs? Is that central business district a 20th century remnant still relevant today? We are pleased to have Chen Tam, Russian city design leader from Arab to share more. Over to you, Chen Tam. Uh, thanks, Amber. Uh, I hope everyone can see the screen clearly and um, the technology works perfect. So thanks for giving me your 15 minutes of your time. That's uh, great. So let me start with uh, introducing myself. So I am uh, Chin Tan. Uh, as Amber said, I lead the city design team in Singapore. And I'm an architect and an urban design by profession. So the kind of work that I do is around city strategy to master planning, to, to government advisory, down to um, looking at transit and architecture coming together. So that's uh, enough about me. The 15 minutes is more about what I want to speak about, which is death of the CBD. So let's start first with the cities of the world. So how did the cities come about and when did they come about in our life, in our lifestyle? So the first cities were around 3000 BC or 2500 BC approx. Uh, this is when the Indus Valley Civilization and all the other uh, components around that came about and uh, approximately population of 50,000 people. So you had this conversation that happened and cities were primarily, of course, for trade and business. So there was always a primary aspect behind that people come together to do trade or business. Uh, but of course, cities at that time didn't have automobiles or anything like that, right? So the cities were designed to be exactly something like what you see right now in modern Turkey, which was very compact, and you had people walking around the, the cities, you had plazas, and everything was very human scale. And that's what worked then. And then we had, of course, a split in Croatia, which is very, very similar. And some of you might know this because the Game of Thrones, if you're interested in keen and you watch that, that's where all of the Game of Thrones is filmed. So very similar scale in terms of how people walked. But then something changed, right? Something changed in 1930s, or early 1930s actually, early 1900s, which is Ford came out with the model T, which was the most mass produced car at that point in time. And that completely redefined what we called a city. That completely redefined how we design cities for that matter. It allowed people to go from one place to the other and even further beyond what they should go to. So what that did was it gave rise to central business districts. People actually moved away from where they worked they, live, they want to live further away in the nice green environment with front yard, backyard, and a dog. And you come to work in this very uh, uh, polluted environment and then go back in the evening where all the lifestyle was. So that was a central business district. And then, of course, what we see now in our uh, everywhere around us, uh, including in Singapore, is this whole idea around office spaces, mono use spaces that come about. And then you start seeing, though not just in Singapore for that matter, I mean, even in Sydney right now, it's crackling with the situation where how they can get people into the city center because city center is dead after 6 p.m. So the whole idea had, but this is what we say in what has happened in the last uh, 20th century, but something definitely has changed in the last 15 years. And what that is, is basically the way we work and live. And of course, technology has to do play a big role in that. The fact that we have technology which allows us to be anywhere and everywhere we want to be connected and to also live our life. But what that has done, and this is where I would like to bring about, this is where it has led to the inevitable death of the central business districts. And by that, what I mean is that it no more has to be central and it's not just about business. So let's talk about this aspect, and I'll break this down to, uh, uh, to you and for everyone in the next 10 minutes or so, because I want to bring about a topic which I call a city as a campus, or let's call it a city as, with a multitude of campuses. So if 
this is a response to what the Death Valley Central Business District is. Let's talk about what it means by city as a campus and what needs to be done to achieve a city as a campus. What has happened remarkably in the last uh, 10 years is also that work has now become part of our lifestyle. And when that happens, what, does, what changes? So what, what is the case is that now that we want to work where we live, or now we want to work in an environment where everything is similar to what, like how it is where we used to live, where we live, you want access to your daily lifestyle choices, which is supermarket, the transport, the shopping, theater, cafe, bars, gym, etc. But more importantly, we want to be in the middle of everything. And I consciously draw the 400 meter radius is because as urban planners, 400 meters is about the right distance that people are happy to walk, especially in tropical environments. So we want to be within that 400 meter radius. We want to be in the middle of everything. But also, in this new age and time, we also want healthy clashes, what I call. And we want to meet different people. We want to meet different cultures. And that allows us to be much more, more culturally sensitive, but also allows us for more innovation. So, that, so these three aspects about having the different aspects where we live, the work has become part of our lifestyle, and the work has become part of our experience, which means the city has to, these three components of the work, experience, and lifestyle, they all fit quite well together with it, and all these three components work towards that experience part of it. So how are we to create the city as a campus? I mean, there are three points that I would like to highlight in here, and I'll start with the first one, which I think is very important in this case, and which is public-private partnership and phasing, which I call PPP and P, because it's not just about the, how we can get the different partners on the same page, but it's also about how we work with that partnership through the years to come, because when we talk about city as a campus, we're creating new campuses, it's not just a year or a five-year phase. It goes on for a long time. And how do you work with the commitment part of it? So the example I would like to use, it's my personal experience, which is King's Cross Lands in London. Interesting story on that one. For those of you who've been there or you know about this, um, what is it, 1980s, I think, if I'm not wrong, uh, Arab proposed uh, the high-speed rail new alignment to come to the city center, to King's Cross, from London, from Paris. The reason why Arab pushed that alignment to the city government, which was finally chosen and taken forward, was that it unlocked development opportunities in three different areas, which, which definitely needed a way to regenerate itself. King's Cross was one of them, Stratford City, which became the Olympic Park later on, and then another one way beyond, which was F's Fleet. But what I want to talk about mainly is King's Cross land. So in 1980s and 1990s is when the government finally approved this new alignment is when this whole idea started about what can happen in King's Cross lands. So the high-speed line came in by 2006. Uh, you always have the regional rail, which is a second circle there. And in the end, that is a development that is currently happening vibrantly in King's Cross, which is called the King's Cross lands. The interesting part of this, when I call it public-private partnership, was that the government uh, created a partnership with a developer called Argent. And together, they basically formulated the entire framework and the structure of how the development happened, which means there's a very nice balance of what the city wanted and what the developer should be doing for the city. And at the same time, that of course, the project had to be uh, business friendly and had to follow the business cases and, the, and, and all the CBS had to fall in place. But it has worked brilliantly well. In, uh, currently, I think it's the third or fourth phase of the development. And that partnership has really given a very vibrant piece of development to the city. And the city has given and in a way come and embraced this development wholeheartedly. But the important part is the phasing, which is right there. That central heart was the first phase of the development. So I remember walking down the street, and if you can see my mouse, I remember walking down the street on this part, which was in 2005, and I would not do that in the evenings because I was short again month. This was when none of these areas existed. So this is 2005. So do you realize the perception of people? This is the time when people didn't want to be in this area. So the first phase had to be something brilliant to change that perception and create a place for people to want to be. So if you look at King's Cross now, and again, I draw the 400 meter radius on the left, it's because this is again that campus site that I've been talking about. It really literally works like a campus. Uh, as, as, as a very functioning campus. So 
The first phase was the government said, we're going to move the University of Arts smack in the middle of the development. And that completely changed and redefined this entire development because it created this whole nice mix of different age groups coming in. But more importantly, it created this public space in front of it. And I was there. I mean, this is this was hipster land, I would say. This is where the avocados and toast and the cow coffees and the baristas were coming. And to be joking, but yes, that was what happened. And that completely changed the place. This is, became the place that people wanted to be. You had the canal, the walk, and the green space and the open spaces, which was absolutely the place you didn't want to be in the evenings. And then what has happened, this is the first phase. What happened is then the second phase happened when you get the Google campus coming in. The first phase wasn't a big multinational coming in. It's only the second phase where this, get this became an attraction and the Google campus came in. This is me last year at summertime taking a photograph lunchtime at 12.30 where people are out and about from different offices having the lunch in this space. And I turn my camera and look at that public space and you see kids playing with the parents and some of them might be working in the university or for that matter one of these buildings, office buildings. And you would have never imagined if I would have shown and talked about what a CBD photograph for you in your mind is, most of you would have thought of the photograph that I showed in the beginning, which was this absolutely big uh, roads. And here we are with CBD with public spaces and, and kids playing and playing. So that's a really important point about the phasing of the public-private partnership. But taking that forward, the second point really connects with that again, which is going beyond zoning. And I call it a true mix of views. A true is quite vital because everyone talks about this mix of views where, oh, you should have the office, you should have the residential all coming together. But the true mix of views is when you actually have that real mix of, of, of integration happening between all these users. So in 2004, we did the King's Cross Central, um, the regeneration strategy. We highlighted what the phase one should be. But more importantly, we highlighted that every use needs to completely merge with each other. It has to become one, but you actually don't see it as a fabric. There is no zoning happening there. So we know in Singapore, the government is looking at the Jurong Innovation District, and it's a great opportunity where the government said, yes, we want to bring the NTU in. We have the industrial area in it, and we have the residential in Tenga, for that matter. This is the uh, east, uh, the west of Singapore, northwest of Singapore, for those, those who don't know Singapore. But the point is here, we still are talking about these regions and sectors and zones. The important thing we want to do is bring NTU right in the middle of the development to change that landscape. So this is the way we would want to think about uh, how we really create a true mix of views. And it's not just about a point in time. It's about the time when you want to see how that develops as years go by. I mean, government's thinking about that already. Uh, you read, there's a new, recent newspaper article where it talks about how they want to bring the CBD more activities, such as residential, et cetera, to make activities go beyond office hours. And that's really great to see that opportunity to come about. But the fact is, how you really can work with all these aspects about going beyond zoning, but at the same time, this, does this work? Uh, well, this was an animation which I wanted to work, but of course, not working at this point in time, but what I wanted to show in this one was a timeline which showed how the activities that we were thinking about a project of activation public spaces, which moved from 2000 in 10 years time, how you activate the space as well. So while you do think about phasing in physical sense, you think about activation in physical sense as well, or uh, activation in, uh, in, in public sense as well. But the future planning needs to go beyond zoning, which is what the examples I was talking about, because Everything that we do in terms of use, the buildings of the future are changing by the hour. You have uh, Airbnb by the day, it becomes your office by the night, it's residential by the other day. So how does zoning work in these spaces? They don't. But when we think about all of that, it's really the idea of what the future of work is. But most of us, we have to be frank, that when we think about the future of work in this environment, we always think about this. We think about the V-work scenario of a very making coffee for your people in the Apple laptops, sitting in this very cool environment, uh, blogging away, or blogging actually is a late 20th century term now, I have to say, uh, scripting away. Uh, but we're forgetting that there is a huge percentage of manufacturing that happens. There is more than 30% who actually are in a manufacturing workforce that needs to be thought about or what happens. That's also future work. And most countries, including Singapore, thinking about what uh, I think about diversity of work and also resilience in terms of different kinds of work that exists. And uh, this is what I really sincerely feel, that manufacturing the service economy 
will be a lot closer than we think in the future because cities also are going to allow that fact to happen. The car parks in the future will make way for uh, automation and also manufacturing. Possibly sitting on the right of our building will be a future manufacturing hubs. I mean, that's not far away. Uh, Industry 4.0 is very clearly talking about uh, upskilling people and manufacturing becoming really, really high tech that should sit in your neighbor's house and you might not even realize that's happening. And this is what we want. We want the buildings to be flexible to allow all of these future aspects to happen. Arab engineers are already thinking about how car parks need to be designed in terms of height and grid to allow change of use to happen in the future. And this is, this is what it's going to be, flexibility. So I feel the manufacturing will be cool again. And let's talk about my third point, which again is a very important point as a walkable campus. Whenever we think about a campus, it always reminds us of our school days and university days, right? You went to your class, got down, walked very comfortably to your canteen, met friends, sat down wherever you wanted, had your meal, and then continued to other place. And there was a whole idea about this creativity and this culture that clashed together. But then when we think about campus, we still, think, we still see these in front of us. We still see the fact that you have these roads and these beautiful buildings, a lot of cool stuff is happening in the background, but we still have a lot of non-campus-like feel to it. And we need to change that because even if you look at Singapore, the one north district, the fact is that, and traffic engineers now would agree to that, the fact is that if you build them, they will come. And this is in terms of traffic. You build the roads, they will come. And how can we change that? How can we adapt that to the 21st century thing about creating a campus-like feel where people are actually just spread around and work wherever they want to work? And we know that the government's thinking right now in other parts of the of, of Singapore, like Pongol, uh, where you're creating that kind of a nice campus feel and where things are merging, which is what we want. So in our we're currently working on something called a movement in place framework, where we're working with the Singapore government to really rethink about what roads are. It's no more about a traffic engineer coming in just designing the road, and then there's a land use panel like me coming in and designing the spaces around the road. We don't want to make roads, you want to make streets. And this is where a movement in place framework comes in, where we think about the entire thing in a holistic form, about the buildings and the roads and everything coming together to form a place, and each of that speak, speaking to each other. Think about typologies of these streets, of what happens at a junction, what happens when there's a viaduct, what happens when there's a school on the side, what happens when there's a theater on the other side, how does a street and the road work, how do people work, how do people move. And in, in a sense, eventually, we want to take away the road if possible. We want to create that entire flexible space that cultural, cultural clash that we want to have right in the middle of our streets. We're going to give the streets back to the people. We're going to give that campus feel back to the people by a variety uh, of uh, building technologies that, that could sit around it. And that led us to do actually a tool which is now about to be finished, which is called the Walkability Wheel. We actually created a wheel called the Walkab uh, Walkability Index. We're able to measure walkability of a city or, for that matter, master, a master plan. I mean, for that, to create that tool, we basically have gone around really looking at, in physical terms, more than 1,000 square kilometers of pavement. We've interviewed people. We basically have created this fifth, a wheel which has 30 uh, parameters, which are qualitative and quantitative, that look at not just the infrastructure part of it, but also understand pure, uh, pure emotional part of it. So the perceptions around safety, the pavement width, accessibility amenity, so the economics comes in play of walkability, or to the policies that play in the role, to the social, economical, environmental, all of those aspects to work with the parameters to be able to eventually define or give a percentage to a city or for that matter a master plan of what the score is. And this is, we are doing it for uh, seven to eight cities in the world and this is just a snapshot of three that exist in terms of where the government or where the city or where the master planner needs to really look at to to change things. The red are the fact that, oh, no, I need to change something around livability. Or for that matter, I need to change something around the social aspect. How do you bring different genders on the street? The male-female uh, split should be, spoke, should be broken down. So all of these aspects work towards a healthy idea of a walkable campus. So coming back to my three-point agenda, it's really the city as a campus to achieve. There are three points that are absolutely vital for us. One is the PPP and P, which is the public-private partnership and phasing, absolutely vital. The second one was an, a true mix of views, which is really important. It's not about creating zones where you can have proximities don't normally work, 
It's about really getting these use cases inside and working well together where you don't realize where your next building is an office building or university or for that matter residential. The typologies are mixed like the way our lifestyles are mixed, like the way our cultures are building together. As I said, work is now become, become part of our culture and our lifestyle. So how does that work in the 21st century? And for the third, that, and that matter, the third point is a very physical point, which is a walkable campus. The first point is very much around policy in a way, in a way, policy and economics. The second point is very much around the cultural aspect. And the third point is a very physical point around how you make and create the feeling of campus. We've spent time now to define exactly what a, a right street section should be for a tropical city, of what works as a campus, what really works in terms of giving you a feeling of a space. So I, when I talk about walkable campuses or, or city as a campus, I can't not talk about Tanjapaga. For all those people who know Singapore and Tanjapaga, it's in fact where our offices currently are. And it's an absolute brilliant mix. And this is what I call a city in the campus. It's got the residential, it's got the HDB, so the private and public housing, it's got the offices, restaurants, startup community, retail, parks, culture, etc. All of this sit, and again, within a 400 meter radius. And if I could, I would like to design a city with multitude of tangible campuses spread around one next to each other and look at how the overlaps of these circles work together as a city. Because it's no more about, as I said, central of the central business district, and there's no more about the business for a central business district. So at that point, I would like to end with the fact that it's about creating a new CBD for the 21st century, and which is not a central business district, it's about creating a cultural business district. And that's, that's when I would stop here. So thank you again. My name is Chen Tan, and uh, that's my provocation of what the 21st century city should look like. Thanks again. I hope I managed in time. I think I managed quite well. <laughs> thank you, Chen Tan, and thank you all for joining us. As mentioned, this presentation was recorded and will be available on our website.